Hello, my name is Dr. Jill Einstein, and I'm the Senior Director of Physician Engagement for the Maven Project. And thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to our friends at Golden Valley Health Centers in California for requesting today's session, Postmenopausal Osteoporosis Drug Treatment Guidelines and Update with Dr. Craig Sador. Dr. Sador was an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center and chief of the endocrine unit at Denver General Hospital. Then after nine years of private practice in endocrinology, he joined Kaiser Permanente Northern California, where he practiced clinical endocrinology for over 24 years and received the Career of Caring Award for Exemplary Physicians. And he's been an amazing physician volunteer with Maven Project. Craig, thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Let me get this here. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jill. And thanks to everyone for being here. Um, good afternoon. And um, today we're talking about really a very exciting topic that um, ongoing changes continue, which is fortunate. So it's postmenopausal osteoporosis drug treatment guidelines, which came out a few years ago, but there's been updates since then. And let me get this here. This information comes from the Endocrine Society, which is the largest group nationally and globally of endocrinologists who take the research and um, distill it for us uh, through their guidelines. And also the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation comes up with very important information for um, clinicians as well as patients. So today's objectives um, to recommend non-pharmacologic treatment for postmenopausal osteoporosis patients. Um, for me, it's a reminder, it's not all medicines. Uh, there's things that have been shown to be helpful. And to identify risk stratification to help manage the treatment, the drug options, the risk assessment for patients. And determine the duration of medication use and subsequent options. And select alternative medications if for whatever reason those drugs of choice are not appropriate for that given patient. So as we've seen, uh, the problem of osteoporosis is devastating. The statistics are large. I'm not going to cover them in this um, presentation, but it is widespread nationally, um, internationally, and it causes a great deal, not only of morbidity, but mortality, and it's very expensive. So whatever we can do to help our patients um, will be um, worthwhile. So the definition of osteoporosis, taken literally, osteoporosis is characterized by a low bone mass, and it's got a microarchitectural disruption, skeletal fragility, results in decreased bone strength, and the bottom line is increased risk of fracture. <laughs> so we've seen um, magnifications where you can see this increased porosity. And you can just imagine, uh, compared to a young patient, how you have really less bone density and that the fracture risk rises. So we're talking really about fragility fractures. So if someone has a terrible trauma, um, you could have someone young, healthy, good bones and fracture, but we're talking about fragility fractures, which occur spontaneously or from minor trauma, such as falling from a standing height or less. Uh, the most common sites of vertebral compression, hip and distal radius, but also pretty high up on the list are fractures of the humerus, rib and pelvis. Now, what's not a fragility fracture are skull, cervical spine, hands, feet, ankles, those haven't been associated with these. And stress fractures are not considered fragility fractures because they're due to repetitive injury, but still plenty of fractures fall within the fragility fracture category. And as we've seen far too many times, we've got this fracture um, femoral neck and it has its devastating um, sequelae. So let's review the classical risk factors for postmenopausal osteoporosis. So most osteoporotic postmenopausal women have bone loss that's definitely related to estrogen deficiency when at the time of menopause, there's a pretty significant fall in estrogen. <laughs> but depending on the age uh, and or age, so the average age of menopause in this country is about 51, so that's young. But the older the patient, the more that the age factor factor 
plays a role. And we see osteoporosis in men, um, but it tends to occur at an age later than in women. <clears throat> so the classical ones are low body weight, past fracture, parenteral hip fracture, current tobacco use, glucocortico use, which can come from prescribed or supplemental medicine, rheumatoid arthritis, any of a number of secondary osteoporosis causes, uh, significant alcohol use, and low bone mineral density. So those are the classical ones. There's other risk factors. So we've talked about parenteral um, osteoporosis and fracture, but it could be any fracture, but especially hip fractures. And a loss of height. It's always worth asking patients if they've lost height. Inflammatory diseases of a variety of causes. And rheumatoid arthritis is not the only one. Hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, primary, secondary, or tertiary. Diabetes, hypogonadal states. And again, menopause is um, a time when it's expected that um, there's less estrogen synthesis. Various digestive and gastrointestinal diseases, malabsorption, lactose intolerance, celiac disease, just to mention some. Cancer, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly prostate, not for this talk, but breast cancer. Um, High-risk medicines, androgen deprivation therapy, aromatase inhibitors, glucocorticoids, as mentioned, PPIs, anticonvulsants, SSRIs, thiazolidinediones, um, and lifestyle factors, smokers, people who are prone to fall or have one unfortunate fall, and immobility. Despite the success in the field, we've got an undertreatment of patients. We've got the tools to assess fracture risk, and we've got effective medicines that have shown over and over for a number of years to significantly reduce the risk of fracture. However, most patients at high fracture risk are not on treatment. So we've got our work cut out for us. And with the aging population, it's a worldwide crisis. So not just here, but um, throughout the um, globe. So let's go through a couple of cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got a 70 year old black female who recently fractured a hip. So 70 um, older patient fractured hip. That's the one devastated uh, fracture that we um, try to prevent, but it occurred in her. So the questions are, what blood test should we get? What other evaluation should we consider? What would you advise for her? And do you prescribe medication? If so, which medication? So with this, the blood tests that are recommended are pretty um, accessible. So serum calcium, phosphorus, albumin, TSH is a screen for hyperthyroidism, thyroid stimulant hormone, total protein, um, there are various um, hematologic causes, multiple myeloma, et cetera, that are involved, creatinine, so renal insufficiency, liver enzymes, alkaline phosphatase, and serum electrolytes, sort of the basis um, for capturing many of the larger categories of secondary osteoporosis. Con um, complete blood count is mentioned. And 25-hydroxy vitamin D, so that gives us um, a measure of the stores of vitamin D. And we're seeing a fair number of vitamin D deficiency in our population. Um, you may have patients that rarely go outside, so they don't get the sun exposure, and their diet may be deficient in um, things that um, would increase vitamin D. So vitamin D is something correctable, easily correctable, and you hate to miss it. <laughs> Calcium supplementation is recommended 1200 milligrams a day from all sources. So some people eat a lot of dairy um, and there are calcium counters in the internet that you can um, calculate how much calcium is from the diet. But many people, particularly older patients, do not get nearly enough calcium in their diet and we expect um, supplementation, at least 500 milligrams a day, but for many 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, and vitamin D, uh, as a real conservative measure, giving 800 international units once a day, a lot of pills come in a thousand, just one a day. Um, some patients may need more for whatever reason. They may have GI um, issues that they can't absorb vitamin D. And the Institute of Medicine said for the average patient, never give more than 4,000 international units a day because you don't want to get vitamin D toxicity. 
Uh, there are rare patients who do need more, but they have a vitamin D issue. Smoke cessation, as we all know, smoking is bad, but this may be the one golden moment that patients go, oh my gosh, you know, my grandmother had a fracture and if smoking uh, adds to it, this could be what tips the patient over into going to smoke cessation and avoiding excessive alcohol. So there are non-skeletal risk factors, and these are worth keeping in mind because the bottom line is you're trying to help this patient prevent a fracture, and these things could lead to fractures. Poor eyesight. Um, it'd be worth having the patient go to eye clinic and get uh, evaluated and treated. Poor hearing. That's been associated with fractures. So having them go to audiology, particularly the older patients who may need hearing aids. Poor balance. Um, balanced training, there are exercises for that. Physical therapy can uh, evaluate patient for gait uh, analysis. So many times I've seen patients and yes, have you fallen? They go only a couple of times. And I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, one of them could have been devastating um, and maybe the next fall will be. So if there's fall issues, now obviously if someone tripped over someone, something that any of us could trip over, that's one thing. But if there's kind of this balance issue, Having physical therapy evaluate can be helpful. Maybe they need a cane, maybe they need a walk or something. Uh, muscle weakness, calcium, vitamin D helps, weight-bearing exercise and resistant training. Um, so there are a lot of these non-skeletal risk factors that are worth considering because for some patients, they play major roles. So getting back to the case, she does fit the criteria for uh, being a candidate for medication. And some people, you know, said, wait two weeks after the hip fracture. Um, you hate to miss that opportunity. So in the hospital, if she could have a prescription in hand, ideally the pill bottles in hand, sure, you can tell her, oh, go ahead and start it two weeks after, but you really want to make sure that she gets on the medicine. <clears throat> and it's interesting with ethnicity. So black women have a lower hip fracture risk than white women, which is good news for them. But the bad news is, unfortunately, they have a higher morbidity and mortality post-fracture. So all the more reason to really hone in on what can we can do to help her. So you want to monitor while on treatment. Okay, <laughs> see me. So the bone mineral density of the spine and hip will assess the treatment response, and we'll go over when to do it. Alternatively, you could check a serum C-terminal cross-linking telopeptide, shortened to C-telopeptide, for the anti-resorptive treatment, which is the most common category of treatment, and uh, or serum, and I won't go through the whole name, the P1NP for the anabolic treatment, and we'll go over those treatments in a future slide. So here's the bone mineral density that folks have seen. Easy test, been around for many years, uh, quick, painless, non-invasive. Um, and you get this calculation. Now, this is usually filled out by the people who do the DEXA scanning. And so you've got your country of origin with your ethnicity. You put in the age, the gender, the weight, the height. And then they do this quick uh, assessment of the classical um, risk factors, fractures, family history, current smoking, glucocorticoids, rheumatoid arthritis, secondary osteoporosis, and alcohol. So alcohol is a big part. So alcohol, as we know, can have devastating um, damage to multiple parts of the body. And one of those is bone, where you impair fracture uh, recovery and reduce the uh, bone density. So all the more reason. And with the um, bone mineral density, they have this issue called alcohol units. And I didn't know exactly what an alcohol unit was, so here it is in one slide. So alcohol by volume is the uh, amount of pure alcohol listed as a percent of the total liquid volume. So it's a volume. Um, so it, it should say on the drink X percentage, so like 12% um, alcohol by volume. And you calculate the units by multiplying the total volume of drink in milliliters by its um, alcohol by volume as a percent, then divided by 100. So that's the strength by the volume divided by 1,000. Here's an example. A pint of beer, 568 milliliters. It's strong lager. ABV was 5.2%. So you multiply them and then divide by 1,000, you get 2.95 units. 
So in the um, calculation of the bone mineral density by DEXA scan, they say three units or higher a day is considered a risk factor. And this patient has just under 2.95, but two pints would definitely put this patient over as a significant risk factor. So here's one example of a filled-in calculation. We've got a 58-year-old um, female, and it's got her weight and height, and her main risk factor is she's a smoker. Everything else is negative. And, and this is through the um, people who do the bone density. They'll put in the particular um, manufacturer uh, of the um, DEXA scan, and they put in the um, grams per um, cubic centimeter. But it calculates this FRAX risk. And so this is the 10-year chance of this patient having a fracture. I mean, obviously it's based on data and it's no guarantee, but it, it gives you a guideline. And so the major osteoporotic fracture, which is non-hip, that could be vertebral, radial, is 5.7% in this patient. And the hip fracture is 0.9%. Those are relatively low um, rates, which is good news for this patient. Okay. So the specialty labs that are rarely needed, 24-hour um, urine calcium sodium creatinine, parathyroid hormone, serum protein electrophoresis, urine protein electrophoresis, the anabolic of bone resorption monitor, the P1NP, and the C-terminal telopeptide. One caveat is if this presentation, let's say we're given next year, I might be saying something different because some people are starting to say that maybe while on treatment, check a C-terminal telopeptide, but we're not there yet. Um, okay, let's go through the uh, risk stratification. And so we've got different categories that really help determine how aggressive to be with therapy. So the first one is a low fracture risk category. And as you can imagine, they'll be filled with patients who have good news information. One is a patient that's had no past hip or spine fractures. That's encouraging. And you do your bone mineral density and the T-score is calculated. And the T-score, by the way, compares this patient to this mythical 30-year-old person. So when children go through growth, and adolescents, their bone mineral density is increasing and it peaks at around age 30. And then the inevitable loss. So men lose also, but women lose faster. So the T-score um, is based on how you compare to that 30-year-old healthy um, individual. So if you have a T-score of the hip and spine that's above, meaning greater, better than negative one, so pretty close to the average. And your 10-year calculated hip fracture risk is below 3%. And your 10-year calculated major osteoporotic fracture risk is below 20%. Those are all good news. And so no surprise, it's not recommended to give pharmacologic treatment. But you don't want to assume this patient is going to be doing great indefinitely. So you want to reassess the fracture risk every two to four years. And certainly sooner if something clinically happened, let's say uh, the patient developed bad rheumatoid arthritis or something else, but for the most part, reassess in two to four years. Okay, now we're getting the moderate fracture risk category. And let's see where that lands. So again, no past hip or spine fractures. The bone mineral density T-score is not as good as the low fracture risk category, but it's not bad. The T-score at the hip and the spine are better than negative 2.5. Um, so in between negative 2.5 and negative one. And the 10-year hip fracture risk still remains below 3% and the major osteoporotic fracture risk is below 20%. So again, no pharmacologic treatments recommended. And you probably have seen patients who have come to you who have been put on medicine. And when you look back at the records, at least by today's standards, they wouldn't be put on medicine. And for those you could um, counsel and, and take off medicine, but clearly monitor. And again, reassess the fracture risk every two to four years. Okay, now we're getting into a more concerned um, patient population. So we've got high fracture risk category. And this is a patient who's had a spine or a hip fracture. 
or has a T-score of the hip or spine that's negative 2.5 or below, so worse than that, or their FRAX calculation of the 10-year hip fracture is 3% or higher, or a 10-year major osteoporotic fracture risk is 20% or higher. So this is a patient, um, maybe they've had combination of this, but we're talking fracture, we're talking low T-scores, and we're talking, we're talking high calculated fracture risk. So no surprise, pharmacologic treatments indicated in these patients, these high fracture risks. They've already shown um, really accelerated bone loss and um, they may have or may have not had a fracture, but we're definitely trying to help them prevent their next fracture. And again, just to point out, you can have a patient who feels fine, who's never had a fracture, but you have a concerning DEXA bone mineral density um, set of data. T-score is low or uh, the FRAX uh, calculated risk is concerning. So we talked about pharmacologic treatment. So for the high fracture risk, patient, what is that? Well, prescribing bisphosphonates, um, which include alendronate, uh, residronate, which are the oral forms, zoledronic acid, the intravenous form, or ibandronate. Um, and I put in here to consider the pretreatment dental evaluation. So there's the rare osteonecrosis of the jaw. A lot of patients have done their homework and they say, whoa, you know, I don't want to get this. Um, understandably. Um, so it's worth asking the patient, you know, are you up to date with your dental prophylaxis? And if you haven't been to the dentist in a while, go soon, get that evaluated just to make sure things are okay. Um, you know, you hate to delay anything, but this is something that would be, um, you, you, you would have done diligence in this aspect. Um, okay. Ibantronate, one of the bisphosphonates is not recommended <clears throat> because there's no evidence at this point, and they've been looking for years, that it decreases non-vertebral or hip fracture risk. So if you're going to go with bisphosphonate, it's it, there's a better track record with the other ones. So with alendronate, um, after five years, there is one study, the FLEX study, that said you could decrease it by one half. So instead of giving 70 milligrams orally every week, you give it every two weeks. I'm not a big fan of this because really what you're looking for is medication adherence. And it's challenging for any of us to take medicines. And there's something nice for you have a patient who takes it every Wednesday. But if there is an issue um, for whatever reason, and the patient really wants to cut it down and is diligent about checking her calendar and making sure she doesn't miss a dose. You, you can give it every two weeks. There is data, but for the vast majority of patients, 70 milligrams once a week works well. Um, so we've gone from the low to the moderate to the high. Now we're at the very high fracture risk category. So as his name implies, um, we're very concerned. So these are patients who not only have had a fracture, but they've had multiple spine fractures. And their T-score is negative 2.5 or below. So worse, you know, farther from the average. Pharmacologic treatment, no surprise, is indicated. And it's recommended to consider anabolic uh, consideration. We'll go through those meds. So the uh, bisphosphonates the, are anti-resorptive. Um, one thing that's helpful to tell patients is even though you put it, you look at an x-ray, it, it looks like very static tissue. It's like just sitting there and actually bone is very um, active. It's like, it's building up, breaking down, building up, breaking down. And it's that coupled phenomenon, build up, break down. It's almost like if you had a building that you're always um, reconstructing, you know, it's never in the same way. So the anti-resorptive like alendronate cuts down, but anabolic is actually um, building bone. Um, bone synthesis. So as we can picture, um, here's a, a good looking uh, vertebral body. And here's the compression, the pancaking uh, that's seen. So even though the guidelines don't say doing this, it's important to realize for patients, they may benefit from anabolic treatment. So the difference between being in the high fracture 
risk category and the very high fracture risk is do they have vertebral fractures? Now, a lot of patients aren't aware they have vertebral fractures. You get sort of an idea if a patient said that she's lost height, you know, <clears throat> um, and if you see a patient, it's optimal with the vital signs to actually measure a height. So when she finds out her now measured height, she goes, well, I used to be two inches taller. Um, that's indicative. And if you see someone with kyphosis, that curvature, the quote, dowager's hump, um, all the more reason there may be some pancaking. But what I recommend is getting lateral um, uh, vertebral x-rays of the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine, and just ask the radiologist just to screen for vertebral fractures. So if they've had two or more, they're in the very high fracture risk uh, category, and they're a candidate for anabolic treatment. So with this patient, when do you reassess her fracture risk? You put her on medicine, that was the right thing to do. When do you reassess? And do you keep continuing the medical treatment? And if you do, how long? Well, as far as continuing bisphosphonates, it's recommended um, to reassess the fracture risk after three years of the intravenous bisphosphonate or after five years of the oral form. If they stay at this high fracture risk, you can go ahead and continue the treatment as you've been doing, or you consider going to an anabolic uh, um, treatment, but you want to stay pretty aggressive. <clears throat> If they improve, so now they drop down from the high fracture risk category to the low or moderate fracture risk, you could consider a bisphosphonate holiday. So you're holding the treatment. You know, you can say, you don't want to say to the patient, you're cured, uh, but say you've responded to the medicine, but you want to keep following bone mineral density with the DEXA scan and clearly clinical circumstances. If she develops some of the secondary uh, causes or if she suffers a fracture, um, you know, the clinical picture is more complicated. And you want to restart um, if there's been a significant bone mineral density. Let's say she goes back to the high fracture risk category, a new fracture, other clinical risk factors. This is a picture of Shenandoah uh, Valley through National Park System. Just so beautiful. Okay, so might a drug holiday be indicated? Well, if the bisphosphonate orally is usually given five years. Um, and if there's been no history of fracture, hopefully, and a T-score is now better than negative 2.5, you could consider a drug holiday for two to four years for lendronate. And for recidronate, it's only six months. So that's why lendronate um, <clears throat> is easier for patients in that sense. But res recidronate, you've got a pathway. However, if they've if the patients had a history of fracture and the T-score is still worse than negative 2.5, um, you could continue the treatment. It's been given up to 10 years and for many patients even longer. And the longer we go on, there'll be more doubt in the future studies that have shown um, even uh, a greater duration of treatment. For intravenous uh, zolandronic acid, it's usually given once a year. So for some patients, that's a big um a uh, pleaser for that, and it's given for three years. And if there's no existing vertebral fracture and the femoral neck has a better than T-score of negative 2.5, you could consider a three-year drug holiday. <clears throat> but if they remain at high risk for fractures, like they have the um, vertebral fractures we talked about, or femoral neck T-score is worse than negative 2.5, keep going yearly treatment beyond three years, of course, as always watching for adverse events. So denosumab, <clears throat> let's talk about that. We've talked about the bisphosphonates. So there's denosumab, which has been, it hasn't been around as long as bisphosphonates, but um, it's been around a fair number of years now. It's an alternative. Bisphosphonates are still the typical tr treatment of choice, but it's an alternative if you have a patient with high fracture risk. So the best candidates are older patients in patients intolerant of other treatments, including the intravenous uh, bisphosphonate. <laughs> or, and this is key, if you have a markedly impaired renal function with a cranial clearance below 35, which really you can't give bisphosphonate. So for these patients, um, these this would be a drug that would be um, very reasonable to consider. <laughs> it's important to correct any hypoglycemia and or, 
hypocalcemia and or vitamin D deficiency before starting treatment. And you want to give the calcium the vitamin D supplementation. And consider the dental evaluation. Again, it's rare, keyword rare, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. So just with the bis, as with the bisphosphonates, you know, make sure they're keeping up with their uh, dental evaluation and treatment as needed. And by the way, when you have patients who are on bisphosphonates or denosumab and they're going in for their routine dental care, they can continue taking the medication. It's only when someone gets something more extensive like dental implants that um, it's a consideration of withholding the medicine. There's no prospective study on how long to withhold it, three months, um, uh, oral, obviously with intravenous. If they're due for one, I would hold it and get them cleared of their dental procedure. No dosage adjustment is needed with chronic renal failure, but if the cranning clearance is below 30, you know, work with the patient's renal team because osteoporosis could be from other factors um, that are related to the renal insufficiency as well as um, postmenopausal osteoporosis. But there's caveats to giving denosumab that are unique to that medication. The off-ramp. Um, how do we get off of denosumab, denosumab? So there are stoppage issues with the medicine. Prior to treatment, it's important to educate the patient that she is starting lifelong osteoporosis treatment. You know, in other words, you don't want her to think, okay, take it for a few years, stop it, everything will be good, because that's not the case. Discontinuing after six months leads to a complete and rapid reversal of all the beneficial effects and they've seen this with the bone turnover markers like c peptide, and the bone mineral densities with fracture protection are likely gone. So it's great while you're giving it, but getting off of it you know, quickly, uh, you lose its benefit. <laughs> Thus, treatment or interruption and drug holidays are not advised. So you really want to tell the patient every six months, um, that's when you get the treatment, You know, make sure you keep your appointments. Teriparatide, which is one of the anabolic meds, is less effective after denosumab has been given than before denosumab. So there's, there's sequential issues. So for denosumab, let's say you've given it five to 10 years for a patient. And that's why for an older patient, it's actually got more uh, appeal, um, but you still can give it to younger patients. So assess the fracture risk after five to 10 years. And if it stays high, continue denosumab, which is the best option. Just keep giving it. If you substitute another med, be sure to give some other medications so she's not off all meds because then she's going to lose her benefit. Sequence matters. So post denosumab med options may not work as well, such as the teriparatide, the anabolic agent. And with bisphosphonates, with, uh, you know, it's recommended, you can start it six months after the last denosumab dose, because that's when you were gonna give the next denosumab dose anyhow. But with or oral, it's a little better worked out. IV, it's a little less worked out, but you know, it's it's putting her on a med. So she's not um, <clears throat> going med medication free, which puts her at risk. And on the bisphosphonates, at that point, you know, you stop the denosumab, they're on the bisphosphonates, keep following the protocol as if she were on bisphosphonates um, from the very beginning. And then with the drug holiday uh, assessment, um, you are gonna be checking the bone mineral density every two to four years. So the anabolic options. Okay, these are teriparatide, abaloparatide, aromosozumab. Um, the bone mineral density gains during treatment or loss in the months after discontinuation. So you're giving these drugs for a really short period of time. Um, things like teriparatide, two years, uh, romososumab, you're giving one year. So um, after that, you've got to give something else. And therefore, you need that typically an anti-resorptive agent, bisphosphonate, or could be denosumab at the time you're getting off the anabolic withdrawal. But these are the most potent medicines for building bone. Okay, let's do the second case. So you've got a 65 year old East Asian female. So different ethnicities, um, Caucasians, Latinos, East Asians have uh, more 
likelihood of developing postmenopausal osteoporosis, or let's say sooner than others. Um, and she's got several past vertebral fractures. So already her age, her gender, her ethnicity, she's got fractures, you know, we're feeling, um, oh my gosh. And she's got a new hip fracture on top of it. So she's beyond high risk. She's already got the disease. So her bone mineral density T-scores, no surprise, were low. Her spine is negative three. Her hip is negative 3.5, well below average. And her frac score, no surprise, spine high, um, over 20%, hip over 3%. So what are the non-pharmacologic measures? I'm not going to go through them again, but again, the eyesight, et cetera. You want to make sure that she's on things that uh, address to lower her risk of fracture. But what's what is the prescribed medication? Well, you can consider the anabolics, like I mentioned, like terry parent. Uh, teriparatide, and you can give it up to two years, and then uh, you switch. And after drug use, you give the anti-resorptive treatment, such as a bisphosphonate. So you, you've done a great job. You've recognized this is a patient at high risk. She's already got the disease. You got it lined up with medicine she should take, but she declines the medicine because of side effect concerns. She doesn't want the bisphosphonate. She's done reading. She's heard about uh, things like osteonecrosis of the jaw. She declines injectables because they aren't convenient. You got to give yourself a shot every day. So what do you do now? Well, there are things you can do. Um, there's alternatives to the bisphosphonates, the um, anabolic medications. There's the selective estrogen receptor modulators. There's raloxifen. Tamoxifen. These are particularly good if you have a patient who also happens to be high risk for breast cancer. But keep in mind, um, if they've got significant risk for venothromboembolic disease, it's not a good medicine. Um, there's menopausal hormone therapy, which in its day, years ago, was given because it does lower the risk of um, osteoporosis and fractures. And it would be with estrogen treatment and progestin to protect the uterus. But if they've had hysterectomy, you can give estrogen alone and you want to avoid it with past myocardial infarction, uh, cerebrovascular accident or breast cancer. Calcitonin, easy to get, easy to take. Um, if that's the only thing they can tolerate, sure. It's not very effective, but it's better than nothing. And we're talking in addition to calcium and vitamin D. The long-term cancer risk, um, the, the question has been raised, it's, it's unknown. And this just gives you an idea of when you look at vertebral fracture, non-vertebral fracture, hip fracture, these interventions help. It, it, you've got a lower uh, relative risk of a fracture. So calcium, vitamin D, and, and the variety of treatments, and you can do it even more with some of the more aggressive treatments. So treatment really does help. Um, and if you look at the values and preferences, if you start at the top, obviously you want some um, medication that's effective and you want to have relatively few adverse effects. Um, then patients um, may prefer the oral, but some patients prefer the injectable. <clears throat> Rather than taking a pill regularly, they're getting a shot yearly. Uh, or the denosumab is getting a shot every six months. And um, then cost, uh, clearly what um, insurance covers, um, duration of treatment, um, drug time in the market. I mean, the ones I've mentioned have been some of them many, many years, others a few years. Um, but, you know, even the, the new kids on the block have been there uh, for some time. This just gives you an idea of the cost. Alendronate, pretty inexpensive comparatively. Uh, Zolandronic acid, um, a little more, but you know there there are the injection clinic fees. Denosumab also you're starting to get increased, but injection uh, clinic fees and the teriparatide very expensive. Um, and again, it covers. Uh, it depends on the coverage, um, Medicaid in your particular area. Um, these medicines, if you look at them lump them together, they're really well tolerated for the vast majority of patients, but of course, side effects are possible. So with bisphosphonates, 
um, gastrointestinal. So with the oral, if you have a patient who has, let's say, significant gastroesophageal reflux disease, she's not really a good candidate for oral bisphosphonate. So that's the one, the intravenous form, um, you know, could really be uh, a, a very valuable alternative. Hypocalcemia, um, you know, you definitely want to correct it. It's not really a big issue uh, in terms of common and very rare, key word, the jaw osteonecrosis and the atypical femur fractures. Um, these are mid shaft. So if you have a patient who talks about pain, um, sort of halfway between the hip and the knee, get an x-ray. Um, I've gone to conferences, I've read the literature, I've seen it, I've never seen a patient with it. And uh, I worked in an area where we had 400,000 patients and we would get together in conferences and talk about adverse effects. And I cannot recall a patient with that, but it's always something to consider because it can happen to any given patient. Denosumab, hypocalcemia, more of an issue. So you definitely want to correct it pre-treatment. Hypophosphatemia, possible, and rarely the jaw osteonecrosis and the atypical femur fractures. Teriparatide, transient hypercalcemia has not really been much of an issue and very rarely, we're talking uh, animal studies, osteosarcoma. But clearly, if you had a patient who had an osteosarcoma, I wouldn't give it. Um, but <clears throat> those are just some of the... Um, things to consider. So this is a very busy slide, but um, it's just something that is in the literature. It's in the <clears throat> um, journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, <clears throat> excuse me, May 2019, which gives a pathway. So for patients with postmenopausal osteoporosis, um, lifestyle, nutritional, definitely calcium, vitamin D, and you want to do your DEXA scan and C. So if you have a patient who's low risk, that's great. Low risk, moderate risk. You keep reassessing every two to four years. Um, if you have a patient who's high risk or very high risk, you definitely want to do pharmacologic treatment. The most common is bisphosphonate. You reassess in three to five years. Uh, if it's intravenous, you do it in uh, three years. If it's oral, you do it in five years. You still want to give calcium, vitamin D, and you're going to recheck them and if they're still high risk, you continue treatment or switch them. If they're low, moderate risk, you consider a drug holiday. If they're intolerant, you've got options I'll go to. Denosumib, um, still uh, reassess them in five to 10 years. Give calcium, vitamin D. Um, the anabolics like teriparatide, two years, giving calcium, vitamin D. Um, and if they go to low to moderate, uh, <clears throat> consider a drug holiday, but high risk, you're going to have to treat them with something else. <clears throat> and the patient's intolerant. Um, if they're under 60 of years of age, less than 10 years postmenopausal and a low uh, venothromboembolic risk, they're um, candidates for CIRMS. Um, it's not very good if you have someone with significant vasomotor symptoms. For, for those, uh, hormone therapy, as I mentioned, if they have a uterus, you want to get progestin. And age over 60, you could give CIRMS, um, tend not to give uh, gonadal hormones for the estrogen, um, but it's down the list. And as I mentioned, calcitonin is at the bottom. So the key message is to patients. Um, fractures are serious. Uh, they may be feeling great and um, hesitant to do anything, but serious and they impact health uh, as well as survival. There is a more or mortality associated with hip fractures. Serious side effects from the medication do occur, but fortunately, very rare. Far rarer than fractures. Drug summaries and package inserts always list the side effects, but they don't state how rare they are. For each potential atypical femoral fracture, there's at least 50 osteoporotic fractures that were prevented. Uh, the probability of jaw osteonecrosis, 0.001%. Atypical femur fractures, 0.001%. So they occur, but it's rare, fortunately. Um, whereas 10 million Americans age 50 or over 50 have osteoporosis and 2 million fractures yearly are due to osteoporosis. This, this is the um, epidemic, uh, especially in our aging population. So it's a chronic disease, just like diabetes and hypertension. It's not curable, but it's 
effectively treated to reduce the fracture risk, um, but it does require lifelong attention. So the take home points, you wanna treat your high risk patients, especially if they've had the past fracture. Bisphosphonates or denosumab typically are the first treatment choices if they're high fracture risk. You wanna reassess um, after bisphosphonate treatment of three for intravenous use, uh, five for oral use. Consider a drug holiday if patients um, then go to the low to moderate fracture risk. No drug holiday for denosumab. They've got to stay on something, um, and that something is usually a bisphosphonate. And prescribe anabolic uh, therapy if you have very high fracture risk, particularly multiple fractures. And supplement calcium, vitamin D in the diet, but usually they need um, the pills um, to treat. So in summary, postmenopausal osteoporosis treatment starts with non-pharmacologic treatment, drug therapy often needed, risk stratification, very important because it points you toward treatment, drug duration, risk assessment, and drug holiday and off-ramp considerations depending on what's given. If drugs of choice are not appropriate, fortunately, there are alternatives. And this is the resources. This is the guidelines that came out of Endocrine Society, if you want to dive deeply into it. And the Endocrine Society came up with an update, and FRAX uh, has their free information via their website. Patient Education Up to Date has something. Uh, the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, things that you can direct patients, as well as uh, Endocrine Society. These are free of charge. Uh, Endocrine Society, FRAX, and Falls and Fractures in Older Patients. Uh, the NIH has a nice section on that. So special appreciation to Kristen Talbot, our program coordinator who got everything set up for this, and to Dr. Einstein, who you see now, uh, our senior director of physician engagement, who's just incredibly supportive and helpful. And the people also behind the scenes, Shirley Severe, Talon, Jonathan Lewis, our IT folks. If it weren't for these folks, these talks would never happen. I mean, we get the easy part. They they set it all up. So with that, uh, let me go ahead and open it up to questions. Great, Dr. Sador, thank you so much for such a comprehensive uh, talk today, and as well as the case examples were fantastic. And before we get to the questions, and feel free to um, any of you to please put your questions um, in the Q and A icon on your Zoom toolbar and we'll um, have Dr. Sador answer them. Just as a reminder that um, a CME survey will be generated once you close out of this session today. And um, if you happen to miss that, an email will be sent out to you um, tomorrow that will have the slides um, as well as the, the CME survey. And a huge thank you for Golden Valley Health Centers for requesting this talk today. So we'll go ahead to your questions. The first is, can uh, we screen all postmenopausal women for osteoporosis under the age of 65? Can yeah. we all postmenopausal women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, important issue. So um, Medicare uh, has been covering patients 65 and older. And so if you have a patient, there's always the hope for this, and she's doing great. Um, she um, doesn't have anything going on. Uh, in terms of her health and her family history, then um, you literally could do it. But in terms of insurance coverage, it may be that 65. But the caveat is there's so many people, women who have some other issue. They may be smokers, they may be uh, extra drink, uh, maybe have secondary issues, maybe lactose intolerant. So you can make a case that this patient younger than 65 has something else going on and you'd rather know sooner rather than later. Um, so it would be reasonable. Great, thank you. The next question, for a patient with hip or vertebral fractures who are started on bisphosphonates, is it recommended to have a DEXA scan immediately? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, you wait for the dust to settle, especially with the hip fracture. And poor patient has been through so much and it's got rehab. So a DEXA soon would be helpful, you know, to know where you are. A lot of times it's also to uh, help the patient later on because she may still have a T-score that's worse than negative 2.5, but let's say she went from three to 2.7. You know, I, I would use that as an encouragement. You know, she still needs to stay on the medicine, but she's doing better. And one um, practical issue is ideally the patient should have 
the follow-up DEXA on the same machine, because there is a machine-to-machine -machine variation, not huge, but um, it's optimal to do that. Great, thank you. Next is, first, thank you for a great lecture. And then um, it is frequently recommended to obtain a DEXA at the time of diagnosis when premature ovarian insufficiency, POI, is identified. But FRAX is limited to the youngest age of 40. Is it okay to use age 40 as surrogate age to calculate FRAX scores? Are there any alternatives? Do you have um, specific recommendations for bone density surveillance and treatment parameters for women under 40 affected by POI or use typical recommendations and parameters? Yeah, great issue. Um, so, you know, the talk is about postmenopausal osteoporosis, but for young women who, for whatever reason, are hypogonadal, you know, maybe they've had um, bilateral oophorectomies, or like you mentioned, you have the premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, so they're effectively in menopause. Uh, postmenopause. Um, so their estrogen levels are down and they they are at high risk to develop uh, metabolic bone disease at an early age. So um, yes, doing the DEXA, um, hats off to you for doing that. And with the FRAX, um, you know, so many times in medicine, we see what's optimal and then we see what's doable. And this is doable. So using the age of 40, um, the thing about doing a young patient is you may not be able to get... <clears throat> Even the, <clears throat> excuse me, there's the T-score, which compares her to a 30-year-old woman, and there's the Z-score that compares her to women her age, and that's valuable. So let's say you have a 30-year-old uh, who's young, and she should be at the peak um, to measure it. Um, so you've got, you've got a basis for the future. Great. Thank you. And there's a couple of more. These are all fantastic questions. The next is, can prolia be started just on patient preference if they don't want to take daily bisphosphonates, even without trying? Yeah, so prolia or denosumab uh, can. But to really let her know, um, uh, this is lifelong treatment, which you don't want to do. I mean, you don't, you don't want to scare her too much, but you, know, you want to give it every six months. And waiting... Beyond seven months, eight months, nine months is not a good idea. So if she really wants it, she should set her calendar every six months. And um, But with that, it's it's got a track record, and it can certainly be given. And just to let her know that if for whatever reason in the future she goes off of it, um, she needs to be on something else. So yes, there is patient preference. Thank you. If there is a patient who received an x-ray for another reason and radiology comments on, quote, possible osteoporosis osteopenia, even if the patient is less than 65 and not postmenopausal and not having risk factors, can they still get a DEXA scan? Yeah. Um, well, certainly medically it's indicated. Um, I agree with you. You know, there's, a, there's enough of a concern um, because the standard radiographs are pretty um, uh, nonspecific and, and not very sensitive. So if a radiologist looks at it and thinks there's pretty much a washout, that's a red flag waving and getting a DEXA would be important. And then doing, uh, if they do have osteoporosis, doing the workup, particularly on a young patient. Thank you. If a patient has multiple non-traumatic vertebral fractures, but a normal T-score, um, do they st you still diagnose them with osteoporosis? Yeah, that you know that you bring up a on, a on a point that we see. So, and and the person who reads the um, bone mineral density DEXA scan should comment on this because they do a quasi X ray. It's not a high quality one, but a quasi one, getting an idea if there's compression fractures. And sometimes they'll look and let's say they'll say L four is a compression fracture, and they'll um, they'll avoid it as part of their calculation for the T-score for the lumbar spine because you get an artificially high bone density with that um, pancaking of the vertebral. So when you get a patient who's got a lot of vertebral disease, let's say osteophytic, um, it just becomes less reliable. So a, t a, a lumbar T-score that is, quote, normal in a patient with lots of spine disease, like I mentioned, um, I wouldn't rely on it. Thank you.
How do I go about with the treatment of a patient who has osteoporosis seen on x-ray, but osteopenia on DEXA? So very similar to what you said before. Yeah. Yeah. So the osteoporosis on x-ray is pretty nonspecific. It's, you know, you, you applaud the radiologist for looking at the bones and commenting, but the DEXA is going to be a lot more specific. It's not a perfect test. As one of my colleagues once said, it's sort of like when you were growing up and your grandmother had the cloth yardstick against the wall. Um, and you get a good idea of how tall you are. And so with future comparison, um, but it's the best um, screen that we have at this point, much better than x-rays. Great. Does nonspecific bone pain be considered as one of the risk factors for screening for osteoporosis with a DEXA scan under the age of 65? You know, it, it has not been um, nonspecific bone pain. Um, one thing that can cause it is osteomalacia, and the most common cause that we have is vitamin D deficiency. So it'd be worth um, doing um, calcium albumin, because it's always nice, so you can um, get an idea how accurate the calcium is, you know, the other tests, and the vitamin D. So at least calcium albumin, vitamin D, just to see if there may, and alkaline floss, see if there may be something with um, osteomalacia. Great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for all these great questions that everybody has today. Oh, here's another one. Well, um, if a man or woman under is under 65 and not postmenopausal was exposed to steroid taper, do they need regular DEXA imaging? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay. So you bring up a good point about glucocorticoids, which um, the, the higher the dose, the longer the duration of glucocorticoids, the greater the effect of what may be coming. And that includes bone loss. So um, for a lot of patients who need chronic glucocorticoids, the rules um, become much narrower. In other words, we're not waiting two to four years. We are going to test this patient now. And if it looks like she needs it for her asthma or rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to we're going to counsel her calcium, vitamin D, exercise, smoke cessation, et cetera, and then test her probably in a year. Um, so it, it's an important point you raise. I mean, it really raises our antenna. And one other thing to mention, and this is a tangent on glucocorticoids, um, what's now become much more appreciated is uh, adrenal insufficiency that, rely, that rises with glucocorticoid therapy. And it's just something to consider. And um, we actually have a presentation on that. Great, Dr. Sador, thank you so much for answering all these wonderful questions so thoroughly and in an engaging way. And we're, we're really happy to have you here today. And the recording and the slides will be sent out um, to all the attendees. And just a huge thank you again to Golden Valley Health Centers for requesting this talk, um, asking the great questions, and also for taking such good care of your patients. You guys are amazing and do a wonderful job um, helping to support um, patients that don't always have um, access to care. So hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and um, we'll look forward to future presentations um, with your clinic. And um, just thank you everybody.